Okay, so this is chapter four, communications and documentation. And there are some national standards and competencies here. Basically, our goal is for you to be able to use simple knowledge of the EMS system, understand the safety and well-being, the legal aspects of things, to know what you should be doing while you are either awaiting for a higher level of care or while you are providing transport all the way to the hospital. Documentation, you need to record patient findings. You need to record what you see on scene. Uh, vital signs, meds, allergies, all that type of stuff needs to be carefully recorded. And then communication, you need to be able to use appropriate communication to call for additional resources, transfer care of your patient, and uh, you use communication within the team structure itself, so between you and your partner or between you and other people who may be there to help you take care of the patient. Um, really good, appropriate communication within your team is important, otherwise things are going to get missed and patients will potentially be harmed. Therapeutic communication is ensuring that uh, you build a good relationship with your patient and doing so allows you to have good interviewing techniques which will allow you to get the information that you need from your patient to provide appropriate care for them. If you don't have a good positive relationship with your patient, you won't be able to get the information that you need. So communication is a big part of that, ensuring that you create a good relationship with your patient. Otherwise, um, you might not get what you need to take care of them. And then we will talk a little bit about medical technology and using the simple medical terms. That's what's expected for you guys. So, communications are clearly important. Um, they are important during all parts of the call. You have to be able to communicate well with your dispatcher to get the uh, information that you need to go on the call. You have to communicate within your own crew, like we talked about. You have to be able to communicate with your team members, obviously with patients, perhaps even as far out as bystanders, and uh, they may be your only source of history. So bystanders can be important as well. And if you don't communicate well with any of these people, including family members and dispatchers and other providers, perhaps from different departments, if you don't communicate with any of those people well, you might miss something. And that might provide, that might cause harm to your patient. So you want to make sure you don't miss anything. Or at least you want to reduce the likelihood that you're going to miss something. And then after the call is over, you have to document um, what you found, what you did, what care was rendered. All of the above has to be documented so that the people down the line who are next going to take care of the patient uh, understand what happens what happens to the patient while they were with you because they will not ever ever see what you are seeing as the first field provider on scene. So talking about some of the systems and some of the equipment that you're going to be using the purpose of that stuff is for you to relay information from one place to another um, when you can't do it face to face. Now Typically, we're talking about radios. You're going to use radios to communicate with all sorts of different people, from dispatch up through the receiving facility, potentially. But there are other ways. Obviously, you can use your cell phones, and those are becoming more and more prevalent out there in the field, as people are using cell phones to sort of supplement their radios. Um, radios, you need to remember, anybody who has the frequency of that radio um, can hear what you're saying. So you have to be very careful about patient privacy and to not identify the patient individually. And then the results you get out are basically only as good as what you put in. So if you give uh, bad information to, let's say, medical control when you're asking for direction, they're not going to be able to correctly advise you. And probably the most common uh, place where we see this is dispatchers. Dispatchers may get grief a lot of the time from field providers because they give us, quote, bad information, but the dispatchers can only give us information that is as good and as reliable as what they receive. 
And a lot of the time, it's not that the dispatcher is giving us bad information necessarily. It's that what they're getting from the scene turns out to be inaccurate. So there are two different types of communication systems out there, broadly speaking. One that transmits uh, voice, so cell phones or radios, and the others that transmit data. And these are telemetry units where you might be seeing people sending uh, EKGs to a hospital, or some places using telemetry for dispatch systems where they the trucks get the dispatch information on a screen as opposed to over the radio, and the screen will tell them what address they need to go to. Voice systems, probably the one you will use most often, and obviously, just like the word the title says, they transmit voices from one area to another. Commonly, we're using radios. They are regulated by the FCC, and uh, if you remember the Janet Jackson wardrobe malfunction and any profanity that is on the air, the FCC can hold you responsible, financially responsible, for that. So, watch what you say. The frequencies are assigned by the FCC or somebody local, so they will tell you this is the frequency for you know, San Juan EMS or whatever the case may be. And as I said earlier, those frequencies are public. So if you start talking on an open channel, a radio channel, about the patient, somebody else may hear that and you could be violating patient's privacy. There are different types of radios. Um, what you will likely be using is a uh, portable radio, whether it's in your truck or one like you see in the picture here that is handheld. But there are also base stations commonly seen at a, uh, a hospital. They may have a base station, or maybe your station may have a base station as well. And um, repeaters are devices that are used to send a radio signal over a longer distance than it could otherwise. And they also help deal with geography. If you're in the mountains or if you're in a canyon, you might not be able to see. Your radio can't see the next radio tower. But if you put a repeater up somewhere, uh, the repeater can hear you and bounce your signal onto where you're trying to go. So you should familiarize yourself with the repeaters in your local area. Repeaters have sort of a limited geographical range of use and you need to understand which one is used where. Telephones. We know that nowadays our telephones do a lot more, but usually we're using them just to talk to somebody. Um, you may use landline. We know what landlines are. Or you may use a cell phone. Pro probably more likely as you'll end up using cell phones to talk to people, uh, perhaps dispatch or a supervisor or um, medical control to get advice you should be doing. Data systems. Some places, typically larger departments, are using data systems like the one you see in front of you and they are sending data to a mobile unit. Um, they may also, this is sort of more old school, uh, use pagers to send a text message for a dispatch to somebody. You don't really see those very often. What you may see, though, are these mobile data terminals that send data to a truck somewhere. Other types of data systems, fax machines, um, telemetry, EKG transmission, and then email, which you won't commonly use in the field. So, what are we doing with radio communication? What's our goal with this? We get our dispatch information from our dispatch center. We get that however it works locally. It could be voice, it could be a text to a pager, or it could be one via one of those uh, displays, mobile data terminal displays, where you're seeing a flashing light or whatever the case may be that tells you you need to go here. It is your job, it is your responsibility uh, to ensure that your stuff is ready to go. So this includes your radios and whatever other forms of communication. And then you want to close the loop on the communication. So if something is unclear, if something from 
your dispatcher, for example, is you're not quite sure, instead of driving off and maybe going to the wrong place, make sure that you've got the right information and don't be afraid to ask the dispatcher to just repeat what they said. That way you'll ensure that you have the right information. So, on the way to the scene, hopefully you know where you're going. Uh, don't be afraid to bust out your map book or use a GPS. Some trucks have GPS on them. Some are still going sort of more old school map books. Whatever the case may be, use the tools that you have to make sure that you're getting to the place uh, you need to be. In route, you should be listening to your radio because your dispatcher is likely still on the phone with the caller getting more information for you. And the information they give you in route may change your thinking as far as what you might be confronting when you get there. And if you, let's say you blow a tire or your truck breaks down on the way to the scene or you run across something else on the road that's going to delay you, make sure you let your dispatcher know so they're aware of what's going on. Once you get on scene, before you get out of the truck, you should do what's called a, a windshield survey from the front seat of the truck you're looking at it and you're seeing what you think, or you're seeing what you see and what that may change as far as resources you need. So before you get out, if it's local protocol, give your dispatch center a little picture, a little verbal report of what's going on. Where are you? What do you see? Do you need any additional resources because of hazards? Um, and then number of patients that you, it looks like you have. Once you're on scene and there are other uh, EMS units responding, you may be giving them a report. So your report could be, excuse me, your report should include information about the patient. How old, what gender, what their problem is, what you've done for them, those type of things. Um, and then you're going to be transferring care once they get there. You're going to talk to the transporting agency and say, here's what we have, here's what we've done, and that's sort of formally saying, and now they're yours. So to transfer care, you're going to go down sort of a checklist of information, the age, the gender, history of the incident, history of what's going on, talk about their chief complaint, talk about their LOC, level of consciousness, and then how did you find them and what did you do for them? You should remember that you're going to see things that nobody else in the medical community is ever going to see about this patient. Because you're first on scene, you're going to see things that the doctor who is caring for them or the surgeon or the cardiologist or whoever isn't going to see. So some of those things can be very important. If the house is entirely run down, if it's clear that an elderly patient isn't able to take care of themselves uh, or their house or their environment, you need to relay that information because nobody else is going to have it. So you have to relay that information because it may have an impact on their long-term care. And if you don't relay it, it'll never be known. And that may also have an impact on their long-term care probably a negative one. So, to transfer care is <laughs> a continuation of the report we were just talking about. You are talking now about vital signs, what you did, use your sample perhaps to translate, to, to turn over information on their medical conditions, and then what did you do? Not only are you going to say what did you do, but how did the patient respond to what you did. That's important as well. Sometimes you may be using online medical control. Some skills, depending on your local protocols, some skills may require you to get permission before you do them. Uh, sometimes you'll be asking for advice and sometimes you'll just be doing a patient care report. Whenever you're doing any of these things, make sure that you give an organized and clear report of what's going on. If you do, the doc on the other end is going to be more likely to sort of trust that you know what you're doing. 
and they are going to be more likely to allow you to do what you want to do, which hopefully will be better patient care for the patient. Once you're done with the call, uh, let the dispatch center know that you're available and back in service and you've transferred care at the, uh, at the hospital. Or if there's going to be a delay, uh, perhaps you need to clean your truck. You had a big, gnarly, nasty trauma call, and now you got to clean things up. Uh, let them know that you are out of service but cleaning up and you will tell them when to be available for another call. So here we see a um, chart from your book with some guidelines of uh, good radio etiquette, sort of good radio manners. You should ensure that nobody's on the radio before you uh, uh, press the transmit button. You should know what you're going to say, again, before you press the transmit button. Your transmit Transmissions should be pretty short, they should be fairly concise, and um, you don't want to be rambling when you're doing your radio reports or your transmissions. The microphone goes a little bit away from your mouth. Press the button before you start uh, speaking. A lot of people speak, they think, at the same time as they start pressing the button, and the first part of their report is cut off. And that can be problematic because the first thing you should do is is uh, identify who you're calling. So let's say you're calling your dispatch center and you're calling San Juan Dispatch or whatever it's called. You would say, you know, San Juan Dispatch is Medic 1. That's the way it should go. And then they're, they're going to respond with something like Go Ahead or Medic 1 or whatever the case may be. Um, some people will talk to you about using 10 codes or uh, whatever type of codes. Just use your regular conversational English. Um, we don't need to complicate things further than they are. Transmissions should be pretty brief. Um, otherwise, the person on the other end might uh, stop paying attention if it gets too long. Um, and then your, your whole purpose is missed. You don't really need to add in such emotion. Uh, you don't really need to add in much emotion when you're transmitting. The book says it's unnecessary to say please and thank you, but it's always polite, even so. Um, and if you are transmitting uh, a phone number, for example, you should make sure that the numbers are understood and sometimes you'll have to repeat them uh, more than once. Should go without saying, don't use uh, profanity. You could get in serious trouble. Um, these frequencies are for EMS only and turn off the radio. Like If you're in the truck and the radio is blasting, turn it off before you get on the radio so you don't send out your favorite Britney Spears song over the air or something. So that's an overview of radio communication. Now let's talk about verbal communication. Um, what we want to ensure here is that, let's say you're asking your partner to do something for you. If you just say, hey, can you do this for me? Can you go get me the BVM? And your partner says, okay, you don't know that they really understood what you asked them to do. So what you need is what's called closed closed loop communication. So what that means is, let's go back to that example, you say to your partner, go get me the BVM, and they say, okay, I'll go get the BVM. That way, the loop is closed, and you know that they understood what you were asking for, and that they are going to go do it. If you just say, go get the BVM, and they say, okay, and wander off, you may not know that they completely uh, understood what you were asking for. So there are certain things that can get in the way of good communication. Uh, distractions can be either internal or external. So external distractions are other people on scene, and your scenes will be noisy, and there will be other people there. And then internal distractions are your mind is not focused on what's going on, and you're thinking about something other than the call. And that can cause a distraction. And distractions are bad because they can negatively impact patient care. So, 
to effectively communicate to a patient. You need to introduce yourself. You need to ask uh, your patient's name. So you should say, Hi there, my name is Sahaj Khalsa. I'm a paramedic on the ambulance, and uh, I'm here to help. What's your name? And if they tell you their name, you should use uh, their title, for example. So they're not immediately, hey, buddy. They are sir or ma'am or mister or missus, whatever their last name. Now, if your patient tells you, call me Bob, well, then feel free to call him Bob. Um, but until they say or until they make it clear that they don't want the sort of honorific of Mr. or Mrs. or whatever, that should be your standard. Uh, especially with elderly patients, don't use terms like sweetie or honey or whatever, because that may have been somebody else, and they are your patient, and they are deserving of your respect. Sir, ma'am, Mr., Mrs. If it's appropriate in the culture you're dealing with, you should keep eye contact. You should take off your sunglasses. As you see in the picture, you should get down to the patient's level so they're not craning their neck to stare up at you. Make sure you don't litter your language with uh, medical terminology. Unless your patient happens to be a medical professional, they're not going to know what you're talking about. And then, if you can, without seeming uh, condescending, you should try and speak slowly and clearly and distinctly so that they understand what you're talking about. It's critically important that you tell the truth. Uh, you don't want to say, yeah, sure, this is all going to be okay, when you don't actually know that it's all going to be okay, and it may very well not be okay. If you tell somebody, you know, you're going to poke them with a needle to give them an injection and, or to draw blood, uh, to check a blood sugar, and you say, no, it's not going to hurt at all, and then it hurts, they're not going to trust you from that point forward. Uh, when you're asking questions, you need to allow the patient time to respond. It's not uncommon to see people ask four, five, six questions in a row without letting the patient respond. And when you do that, you will get an answer typically to only the first or the last question that you ask. And you may have asked two or three good questions in between, but you're not going to get answers to them. And the other thing that can happen is the patient can get upset because you're sort of badgering them and you're not even giving them a chance to respond to them. Ideally, there should be one person talking to the patient, not multiple people. You want somebody who is developing a relationship with the patient, showing the patient that they can trust you. And you can do that by uh, limiting the number of people talking to them. Now, sometimes your partner, even though it's technically your call, your partner may develop a better relationship with the patient. And it's perfectly okay at that point for your partner to be the one doing the majority of the talking. Body language carries a ton of meaning. So if you're standing there with your arms folded across your chest and a scowl on your face, even if you're using the most polite language, it's going to become clear that uh, you are not particularly uh, open to what they're talking about. And then this last point, act and speak in a calm and confident manner, is important because doing so instills confidence in your patients. If you are scared out of your wits, and it's very clear that you're scared out of your wits, your patient is not really going to trust that you know what you're doing. And that's going to raise their stress level. And that's going to make your job more difficult. So you want to make sure that even if you're scared out of your mind, you act like you've got this, like it's no problem, like you've seen this a million times before. If there are some cultural norms for a patient, for a, a local community that you are dealing with, you should respect those as much as possible, uh, unless they're interfering with your care, which uh, they typically don't. So... Whenever possible, you should respect their cultural norms. Now, in some cultures, looking somebody in the eye is a sign of disrespect. And if you happen to be treating a patient of that culture, don't, uh, don't force them to 
look you in uh, your eyes, and don't look in their eyes if you know that it's uh, not a cultural norm for them. There's a difference between open-ended and closed-ended questions, and you should use each one in its appropriate place. An open-ended question allows the patient to sort of describe something and fill in the blank. On the other hand, a closed-ended question sort of gives them a yes or no answer to uh, the question. So as an example, an open-ended question, you could ask them, well, can you describe your pain for me? That allows them to fill in the blank. A closed-ended question would be more along the lines of, is your pain sharp? That's a yes or no question. There's not really much discussion there. There aren't blanks to fill in. And then, this is sort of the golden rule of EMS, this last point, is to treat all of your patients as if they were members of your family. Of course, the uh, caveat here is, this is assuming you like your own family. Now, if for whatever reason you don't like your own family and you would treat them horribly, then forget about this rule. You should treat all patients as if they were your loved ones, as if they were people who are important to you, because they are all important to somebody else. So now we're going to talk about patients who specifically have special needs. Uh, there's a number of different types of special needs that you may encounter. We're going to talk about starting with uh, hearing impaired patients. So first thing is if they can't hear at all, you should identify yourself by doing something like showing your badge or showing your you know, EMR patch so that they understand who you are. Sometimes, and this is sort of a judgment call, it may be helpful to you know, gently touch the patient, patient's shoulder so they can look at you when you're talking. Some hearing impaired people can read um, lips. Another thing is speak sort of slowly and clearly, but if they're hearing impaired, uh, or if they can't hear at all, shouting isn't going to change anything, so there's no point in shouting at them. And then you can watch them to see if they are understanding. You can sort of get an impression of whether they're understanding or not by taking a look at them and seeing what it looks like they're understanding. And if need be, you may need to repeat or rephrase what you've said to them, again, using language that is as clear and as simple as possible. And then if none of this stuff works, you can revert to some really simple things and just write down what you have to say to them, and they can respond in writing as well. Sometimes they may be able to speak to you, so they may be able to respond speak in, speaking or by writing. Visually impaired patients, talk to them. Tell them what's happening. Tell them what's going on. If there are funny noises, you can explain to them what they are, what those noises are, and describe sort of the surroundings to them. As with any patient, you should uh, have uh, you should know their name, and you should use it appropriately throughout your time with them. If your patient has a service dog of any type, ideally you should keep this service dog and the patient together. Service dogs are trained to do a lot for patients, and the patient may feel very sort of uh, lost or uncomfortable without their service dog, uh, so keep them together. And it's a common weird thing that people do, is they'll be dealing with somebody who's visually impaired, and they will start um, speaking louder to them for some reason. No idea why this happens, but it doesn't do anything, so no not. Um, people who don't speak English, it's a pretty common occurrence around here, so if you don't speak the language of the patient, whatever that may be, um, figure out how much English they speak and try and use that to the best of your ability. And if that fails, you can try to find an interpreter, but you want to sort of be careful of using an interpreter who is let's say, like a child family member. That's not your best route, but find the best interpreter you can. And then you, there's a lot that can be done with facial expressions and body language and pointing and gestures and things of that nature. And again, sort of in the realm of silly things people do, people will tend to speak slower. <coughs> Excuse me. People will tend to speak slower and louder. I promise it doesn't help. If the patient doesn't speak English, 
you yelling questions at them in English very slowly doesn't make a difference. Uh, they just really makes you look silly. And another thing is, people will commonly seem to assume that patients who have special needs, whether it's hearing or visual or language, are not intelligent. And that's not true. Just because somebody doesn't speak English or because they have a hearing issue does not mean anything at all about their intelligence. So ensure that even though, you know, you may have a patient who uh, can't hear, that you don't treat them as if they are not smart. Geriatric patients, this is another place where people sometimes look at a patient and say, well, this guy is 85 years old, he must not be very sharp or very with it, and his mind is probably gone. And they'll start talking to this gentleman as if he is, you know, his mind is going when this this guy may be totally uh, mentally intact. So talk to them just as you would any other patient and give them the respect and the courtesy that you would any other patient. Uh, pediatric patients are a particular challenge. So they're going to be scared. They're not going to know what's going on. And now they're, they've been hurt or they're not feeling well. And now some weird person is going to be in their face and asking them questions and potentially causing them harm. So if you can, keep familiar people and things around them. If the child has a toy or a stuffed animal of some kind, let them hold it if, you, if it doesn't interfere with care. Talk to them. Let them know what's going on. Don't treat a child as if they're not intelligent. And if you can, keep a parent or a caregiver with the child so that they can help keep the child calm. And this is not necessarily the time when you want to use Mr. and Mrs. They may want you to use their first name. That may be more uh, comforting to you. Get down at their level. If you can, turn down your radio. Take off your sunglasses. Do everything you can to sort of make, humanize yourself so that you are not this scary person with sunglasses that maybe are mirrored on and they can't see your eyes and you've got a radio that's squawking away. Get down on their level take off your sunglasses, turn down your radio, and above all, be honest with them. If you need to check a blood sugar, it's going to hurt a little bit. So tell them that, that yes, it's going to hurt. And when you're assessing a pediatric patient, you should always assess the place of their injury last. If they're complaining they busted ankle or hurt ankle, and you go and immediately start palpating that ankle and poke it and say, is this the one that hurts? you likely won't get to touch that patient ever again because you've just destroyed the trust that they may have had. Developmentally disabled uh, people, the, what we want to find out here is what is their sort of baseline, what is their norm, what is their level of communication. And tailor your communication to whatever that may be. If they can normally understand full sentences and communicate well, well, speak to them as you would any, anybody else. If, however, their developmental disability has left them unable to understand and they can only sort of comprehend simple and short sentences, well, use that type of communication. And, and be patient with them because they may be a little bit slower to get what you want than a non-developmentally uh, delayed patient B. Sometimes you'll come across people who are um, disruptive. If they are disruptive, you need to figure out why. You want to try and figure out why they're disruptive. And most important, you want to ensure that there is not a medical reason for their behavior. There are many medical issues that could lead to disruptive behavior, and sometimes we uh, will overlook those. We'll say this guy's just being a jerk or he's drunk or whatever. And it, that's not necessarily true. You may be dealing with a person who is actually disruptive because their blood sugar is 12, for example. And if you just write them off 
and don't address their blood sugar, you've caused harm to the patient. So make sure that there is not a medical cause for their disruptiveness before you sort of uh, blow them off. Um, then you need to make sure that you and the patient are protected. If it looks like the patient might run, uh, get between them and an exit, keep an eye on these type of patients. And if they're really violent or hard to control, get law enforcement involved. You, you're not, it's not our role to sort of tackle and wrestle people to the ground unless it's absolutely necessary and there's no other way out. Now, once you've gotten everybody safe and you know that you're not in danger anymore, then you can care for the patient. Uh, some family members may say, well, this person needs to go to the hospital. Um, and you need to know what the criteria is to transport somebody against their will. In New Mexico, that's a law called the EMS Transport Act. And what that law says is that you can only transport somebody against their will if they meet all four of these criteria. Number one is they must be at imminent risk of loss of life or limb. So that means if they don't get care, they're going to lose a, their life or a limb or basically have serious, serious injury. Number two, they must be judged incapable of making a rational decision. So we believe for whatever reason, whether it's medical or trauma or whatever, this individual isn't making rational decisions anymore. They must be cared for by at least an EMT. So if you find yourself in a situation where you think you might be transporting against their will, as an EMR, that's not something that New Mexico law allows you to do. So you need to get an EMT or higher level of provider on scene. And then the last one is they have to be transported to an appropriate facility. And an appropriate facility would be a facility that can deal with the issue they're having. So, as an example, if they're having a psych issue, issue, you need to bring them somewhere where they can at least be stabilized and that can be cared for. And if you have a small community clinic, uh, that might not be the right place for them. That might not be an appropriate facility. So they need to go somewhere where their issue can be cared for. Okay, so now we're moving away from talking to patients. And now we're going to discuss a little bit of uh, medical terminology. Medical terminology is a, it's a collection of technical terms that medical people use to do certain things, to identify anatomy, to talk about illnesses, to talk about injuries, and to discuss treatments. Now, you don't necessarily need to use medical terminology all the time, but you've got to understand it. And you've got to understand it because, number one, you are a medical professional and other medical professionals are going to be using it, so you've got to be able to talk the talk, sort of. Um, but it's medical terminology is kind of like its own language, and it can be kind of difficult to understand it, and some people use it too much, and they'll get all kind of crazy with their medical terminology. So, you know, use it when appropriate and use plain English when appropriate. Well, you need to be able to communicate with other medical providers and other medical providers are typically going to be speaking using medical terminology. So that's one of the reasons you need to understand it and be able to use it. But if you don't know what terms mean, this isn't the time to start throwing out terms because they sound good, you heard somebody else use it, but you don't really know what it means. So if you don't know what it means, just use plain English. Nobody will fault you for that. And then as you learn, or as new terminology is introduced into the book and into the course and into your vocabulary, the best way to go about figuring out what it means is to break it down. You look at the construction of the word, you can look at the root, you can look at the prefix, which is the beginning of the word, and the suffix, and we'll look at some examples here. So here we see some examples of prefixes. These are used at the beginning of words. So brady means slow, for example. Tacky means fast. And those can, can apply to a number of different things. For example, bradycardia, cardia meaning heart, is slow heart rate. Tachycardia, fast heart rate. It can also be used with breathing. Tachypnic is breathing fast. Bradypnic is breathing slow. So 
you can go over that list, and there's a, a, some more in your book as well. And it's important to sort of start getting a understanding of these terms so that you can start using them, using them appropriately. Uh, documentation. This is what we have to do. As the saying goes, I'm sure you've heard it, the job's not done until the paperwork's done. So documentation is what you do. You write down what you have done. Um, well, it's probably not going to be written in the old sense of the word. It's going to be on a computer. So you put into a computer what you did. At a bare minimum, your documentation should include age and history, condition when you found them, description of what uh, their problem was, what you did for them, their chief complaint, their LOC, or level of consciousness, what you found on physical exam, medical history. Okay, so that's the bare minimum. And you will get practice in writing good documentation, and you will get practice in uh, you know, doing a call and then writing out the, the uh, documentation for it. Now, you will also see multiple different ways of writing a report, or, sorry, typing a report. You don't need to copy anybody else. You may find somebody who does something you like, and then somebody else who does another part you like, and you'll develop your own style over time, and that's perfectly acceptable. To continue what should be in your documentation, if your patient had a serious change, you need to note that. If you turned over care or somebody else uh, was the transporting agency and they took over treatment, you should note who they, who they were. Basically, you should be able to track that patient from the minute you got there until they were either turned over to somebody else or they were transported to a facility. So it's not enough to say patient was transported to San Juan Regional. You've got to say, you know, patient was taken to San Juan Regional, placed in bed number whatever, care turned over to nurse, and fill in their name. That way, if somebody ever comes looking for this patient, and it has happened where patients have gone missing in the system, you can say, well, look at my report, and right here I say, at this time, the patient was turned over to nurse ratchet in bed number four. Uh, and you close that circle, and now they can go chase Nurse Ratchet and find out where that patient went. If, on the other hand, you just said patient was transported to the ER, you don't know who you turned over care to, and sort of the trail ends with you, and you don't want to do that. Times are important to your uh, documentation. You should note at a bare minimum, dispatch time, on-scene time, on scene time for other people, when you left the scene, when you arrived at the hospital, turnover of care, all of the above should be included in your time write out. <clears throat> other things that you may need to document, reportable conditions. Reportable conditions vary from state to state in New Mexico. Things that you're likely to encounter as reportable conditions. Uh, child abuse is a reportable condition. Elder abuse is a reportable condition. Animal bites, like dog bites, are reportable. So are certain infectious diseases. Um, meningitis and hepatitis and things like those are, are reportable causes. And those need to be reported. And by reported, I don't mean that you write it down and forget about it, especially with something like child abuse. If you suspect child abuse, you need to document facts. So you need to document the facts that lead you to believe that there may have been child abuse. And that's not things like, well, mom was a jerk. That's not a fact. That's a opinion. Maybe a accurate opinion, but it still doesn't belong in your report. So when you suspect child abuse, you want to document things like patient had bruises in multiple stages of, he of healing, or had wounds consistent in a shape of an electrical cord, or something like that. But those are facts. They're verifiable. And then you need to report that to CYFD, Children, Youth, and Family Departments. It is not enough for you to tell the ER staff that you suspect child abuse. 
That doesn't constitute reporting because the nurse you talk to may be busy and she may or he may forget to report it. Any other unusual stuff, um, any helpful stuff, all should be noted. And these reports need to be finished as soon as possible after your call. If you wait, you'll forget stuff, your report won't be very accurate. Okay, so now let's talk about how you get a medical history. And you can use what's called a sample history. And sample is an acronym, and it stands for signs and symptoms, allergies, meds, past medical history, last oral intake, and events leading up to the incident. And if you get each one of those answered, as you can see on your screen, you will have a very good understanding of this patient's medical history and their current complaint. You get allergies, you get medications, you get their medical history, the last time they had anything to eat, and what was happening before they called you. So practice when you start writing down sample on a glove if you can, or a piece of tape, and leave it blank next to it, and you can fill those things in as you do your assessment. That will help you get a good assessment and a good history on your patient. There are different types of reporting formats uh, out there. D-chart is probably the most widely used, but you may also see what's called SOAP. D-chart is a format, and it stands for Dispatch, Chief Complaint, History, Assessment, Treatment, Transport, and sometimes you'll see it go French, and it'll add an E to the end of it. Um, the exceptions portion. This would be where you would add in, let's say, your engine blew on transport, and so you were delayed. That would go in the exceptions bit. But other than that, it's pretty straightforward. Your dispatch information is what your dispatcher tells you. Um, you are responding to a 65-year-old male complaining of trouble breathing. That's your dispatch information. And then you can add, you know, chief complaint. And this is where I always like to use the patient's own words. You walk up to the patient, introduce yourself, and they say, my blank hurts. That's their chief complaint. And use quotes here. Put their chief complaint in quotation marks. History uh, is both history of the present incident and their medical history. So you could put meds and allergies in there as well. Assessment is your findings, what you found when you did your physical exam. The R is treatment. Think of it as RX. It's the treatment, what you did for the patient. Transport, where you took them, what mode, uh, and how they got there. And then exceptions would be anything that happened in route, like I mentioned. SOAP is a little bit different. It's a subjective, objective assessment and plan. And so it sort of roughly follows D-chart, but you're telling more of a story here. And if you are expected to use SOAP as your primary report format, you will uh, understand a little bit more. You get into subjective as the story, objective is the stuff you can measure, assessment is your physical exam and what you found, and then the plan is what you're going to do for the patient. SOAP tends to be used more in a clinical setting where they're in a hospital or something of the sort. It's not commonly used in the pre-hospital environment. Okay, so now we're going to just summarize everything. We talked about communication systems. They allow us to relay information from one place to another. Um, but communication skills uh, are important throughout the call. We talked about closed-loop communications, ensuring that your partner or the patient understood what you were talking about, and how important it is that you develop a good rapport with people, otherwise they're not going to give you what you need. Uh, radio uh, communications are important, verbal communications are important, and we talked, as I just was, a little bit about uh, in-person communication, which is going to be with a wide variety of people, some of whom may or may not really want to talk to you. Body language is critically important. Some studies show that as much as like 70% of information is translated, transmitted by body language. So even if your language is very nice and polite, but you're standing there with arms crossed and a scowl on your face, you're not doing much to gain the trust of people you're taking care of. Special care or special needs patients. We, we talked about special needs patients. 
and how you can sort of still provide them the care that they need, even though they may be challenging uh, to do so. Uh, do use all of your skills, all of your communication skills to ensure that even though they are challenging, they're still getting care that they need. And then when you get to the hospital or when you um, turn over care to a transport agency, you need to um, complete your written report uh, or your computer charting report, whatever happens at your uh, service. Written reports or computerized reports are important because they become a permanent part of the patient's medical record and there will be information in them that is not found anywhere else because you see things that no other medical professional uh, will see when you respond to the scene. Okay, so a few review questions. So when you're talking to a sick or injured patient, which one of these do you think is most important to do? And I'll give you a little bit of time to look at the answers, and then you can choose, and we'll flip over and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is D, to maintain eye contact as much as you can. I want to put sort of a caveat to that uh, in exception is make sure that it's culturally acceptable where you're doing that, that eye contact is okay and not considered rude. Okay, next question. Which of the following is good communication? What do you think? Take a look and we'll uh, flip over the answer here in a minute. Okay, so that was obviously less than a minute, but there's the answer. You should minimize uh, distractions because if you um, d don't minimize distractions, you're going to miss things, and you don't want to miss things that'll provide for poor patient care. I think we got two more here. Now here we go. When caring for a kid, a pediatric patient, which of the following should we consider? Should we separate them? Should we <laughs> speak to them in an authoritative tone? Should we allow a parent to hold them, or should we uh, perform painful procedures without giving them any warning? And I think specifically about this one. The parents should hold the child if the situation permits it. Oh, and I was wrong. There was not one more. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask your instructor, and they will be happy to help you find the answer.